Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I know that this morning uh, you have been able to be with Bishop Reka, our, our shepherd, our pastor, as he celebrated Mass uh, for all of the teachers and administrators of the Catholic Schools in the Diocese of Birmingham. I'm Father John McDonald. Uh, I'm the pastor of Sacred Heart of Jesus Parish in Anniston, Alabama. Uh, previously, I was principal at John Carroll Catholic High School for a number of years and then uh, director of education for our diocese here in Birmingham. Um, so I'm so glad to be with you all today to share really some moments of spiritual reflection above all things about what it is that we do as uh, Catholic school teachers, how we're supposed to live, and above all, how we're supposed to allow ourselves to be loved by Christ and then love others as he first loved us. So we're doing this a new way this year. We're all uh, getting used to new things. And so I just wanted to share with you some spiritual moments on retreat uh, for really about 40, 45 minutes today, uh, just talking about some important things. We do it a little bit differently this way. We can't uh, have uh, the same times of prayer that we would in a normal retreat. So I'm going to have to just trust that uh, with the information that we share today, you will be able to sit down uh, with the materials that you've been given and then follow some of the sacred scriptures that we will talk about today and let them become for you sort of the warp and the woof of the fabric that makes up your spiritual life as a Catholic school teacher. So why don't we begin with a prayer? Uh, as in all things, we'll call on the Holy Spirit to help us to understand in a profound and beautiful way the love of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So being a Catholic school teacher is a wonderful thing. I consider it to be one of the greatest and most beautiful identities uh, that I have been given by God in my life to be able to teach in Catholic schools. I love it. I feel like it's very much part of who I am as a disciple of Christ. So I have a retreat here, and I know that you have the materials to follow along. Um, your paper materials might not have all the effects uh, in transitions that I have in my little PowerPoint here, but we'll follow along uh, with what we've got here prepared uh, for our time together. So our title is Lift Up Your Hearts, which is in Latin, Sursum Corda, which is the motto of our bishop, Stephen Reka. It was also the motto of uh, Bishop David Foley, our emeritus bishop who passed away uh, last year, who we love so dearly, but it's also part of the Mass. Lift up your hearts. It's the part of the Mass right before we enter into the preface, which tells us a little bit about the kind of season of the year and the prayer that we're making before God. The preface of the Mass gives us an orientation as to what we're praying for at different moments in the year and different feasts. And we know that our prayer has to be foremost in our lives if we're going to do anything uh, worthy in our work in Catholic schools. So we do want to lift up our hearts. We can't physically do it. Because then, guess what? We'd all conk out dead. We just can't rip it out and lift it up. But in a spiritual way, and in a real way, we lift up our hearts to meet God above all things. So that's what I want us to do today, to have an encounter with Him in a special way. To know God, to love God, to follow God in all things. So we do have a special spiritual identity as Catholic educational leaders. Um, and we have to let that spiritual identity form what we do, what we say, and how we teach and lead our young people to learn and know more about Him. It's been said for so many years that one cannot give what one does not have. So we can't lead our young people to Christ unless we have Him very much at the root of our existence and who we are as teachers. So, let's see here. What we're going to do today, the aim of our retreat is to learn more about our own interior lives. Sometimes we don't know ourselves very well as spiritual beings. We come to uh, spend a lot of time describing ourselves by our external characteristics. Uh, sometimes people say, well, 
you know, I'm, I'm just one of those people that has a, a quick temper. I'm quick tempered. I'm not very patient. And we describe ourselves by these reactions. But that's not actually who we are. It's not who God intends us to be, to describe ourselves by our reactions to external stimuli. We have an identity in Him, in our interior, in our soul. And so we want to learn more about that today. And particularly, we might want to actually identify some of those things that hinder what Christ is trying to do in us. Sometimes we put up some roadblocks and say, here and no further. And we have to identify those and then remove them so that Christ has a straight shot to this heart uh, that we want to lift up for him. There are things that we keep closed, things that we keep locked within. And again, this is not the moment for us to turn to our neighbor and tell them all our big, bad, ugly, nasty business. But at the same time, we have to be honest with ourselves above all things and know what we keep locked up in our hearts that sometimes hinders God's loving and purifying touch. That's how we come to know God, by knowing ourselves. He's given us a path to know him. From the very beginning of human history, this has been a great source of wisdom. Know thyself. And as we know ourselves, we come to know God. And as we know God, who is love, we, being loved, learn a pattern of how to love. And that's a beautiful thing that comes from our faith above all things. And I remember somebody told me a long time ago that young people, children, our own children, our students, they will always come back to the place that they were loved the most. This is a great truth. And what we want are our young people to be accompanied their whole lives until they go to be with Christ in the kingdom of heaven. I've often heard it said, too, that people don't put their children in Catholic schools to get them into Harvard. They put their children in Catholic schools to get them into heaven. So we want to be able to follow God and to lead others to follow him by our good example. So how do we know him more clearly? How do we have a clearer identity of God? The first door that we pass through in knowing him is by giving thanks to him. We know him by the gifts that he has given us. Um, that's the way it is in any relationship. If somebody has, let's say for instance, there's some young lady who has a man that is interested in her and she thinks he might be a nice boy and might be somebody that she might like to marry, if he shows up and gives her a vacuum cleaner, well, she knows a little something about him, about a gift he gave. If he gives her an iron, an ironing board, she might know something else. But if he shows up and gives her a two and a half carat diamond solitaire, well then she might know something else, that he is really, really dedicated to her. So we know people by the gifts that they give. And we also know God by the gift that he has given us, life, the ability to love, freedom. And he made us in his image and likeness. We're the only creature ever existed that has been made in the image and likeness of the Creator. And that's one of the greatest gifts, and we have to live up to that gift in beautiful ways. So we give God thanks, but we can also ask God for great things. And I think we should ask Him for marvelous things. We should pray beautifully and ask Him for those things that are most important to us. So I think we want to ask God for a grace. Now each one of you has a grace in your heart that you want to ask God for. So think about what it is that today you want to ask him for this year. The prayer that you want to make, but specifically ask him for a grace, something extremely clear. Oh Jesus, I want you to grant me the grace of understanding for people that are different from me, for people who are difficult. I want you to grant me the grace of understanding for myself, because I often find myself in confusion, mystery, whatever it is that you want to ask. It's important for us just to take a little moment and think about the grace that we want to ask God for for this coming school year, for our whole lives. You'd be amazed at how he answers the prayers that um, 
that we ask of him, the, the beautiful and miraculous way. So one grace, though, that we could ask for is to be filled with gratitude for the wonder of how he's made us, created and gifted by a loving God. So we want to ask God for gratitude, for a thankful heart. The scriptures speak to us about that, how important it is to always be a person of a thankful heart, a joyful heart. That's Psalm 100. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Our students don't like us to sing too much. They're like, oh Lord, Father, don't sing. They don't like that. But the song in our hearts is one of praise for God for having made us so wonderfully. Some suggestions for our prayer. In the very beginning of the Bible, in the first chapter of Genesis, verse 26 through 31 we read about how God made us he made us in his own image St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that the human person is closer to God than the angels because we're made in his image and likeness but the angels are a different order of creation they're not made exactly like God but we are and so he's given us an honor and a nobility in our person dignity, human dignity, which we must respect in every human person, made in the image and likeness of God. Psalm 8 is a beautiful psalm. It's actually a psalm that's often used at weddings. Um, it also says that we are crowned with glory and honor. Um, but what is the human person that you could spare a thought for him? This tells us that God has actually elevated us. He's raised us up. He thinks about us constantly. And that's how another way that we know him. We are always in his mind. He never stops thinking about us. If he were to stop thinking about any one of us for just a second, we would disappear, go out of existence. He thinks about us and loves us and wants us to love as well. In Psalm 139, which I think is beautiful, a lot of times there's little titles in the Bible above the Psalms. This one in my Bible, Psalm 139, the inescapable God. He's everywhere. But it says, O Lord, you have searched me and have known me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You discern my thoughts from afar. God knows our every thought, our every feeling, our, all our sufferings, all our joys. He knows us. A good teacher, a wonderful teacher, also knows his or her students, tries to know them, tries to be sensitive to their needs, also thinks about their parents. You know, I've always been amazed over the course of my whole life about the people that have taught me, and then later, years later, when you have a conversation, you realize that that person was thinking about you. You didn't even realize it. You were in a class and later the teacher tells you something and you're like, oh wow, they were thinking about me and I didn't even know. I didn't think I was that important to them. How much more with our God? But I think good teachers do think about their students all the time. They worry about them a little bit, want them to do well. They think about their home situation sometimes if it's difficult. They pray for them. The same thing that good parents do. They think about their kids and, and uh, what they need and all those things. And that sort of solicitude, that sort of positive worry, that's a good sign of who we are. It's also a good sign that we're thankful to the things that God has given us because we want other people to share them as well. Again, coming to know God, we want to ask for the gift of gratitude for relationships relationships that we enjoy with one another. Our God is a relational God. He doesn't exist just way up there in the heavens, you know, separated and apart from us. He exists to be in relationship with us. As Catholic Christians, this is what we call Holy Communion. He wishes to be in communion with us. That's his desire. And then we have to respond to that desire to live in communion, to live in relationship a creative, relational God who makes a way for us. That's why we celebrate the Mass in the Catholic Church. 
uh, basically every time we get together, we celebrate the Eucharist. It's the identity of who we are as a relational people, to gather around the sacred table and to share the goods and benefits that God wants to give us. So that's another way that we know God, again, by the gift that he has given, the pure and perfect gift of the Eucharist. Again, I have some texts for prayer in your, in your quiet time. In the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, the 13th chapter, about loving our neighbor, how we enter into relationships that are true and good, right relationships. John the Apostle tells us in the 17th chapter, he tells us about Jesus praying, and Jesus prayed for all of us. Right before he gave, was given up his passion, death, and resurrection, he prayed that we would all be one. Jesus prays constantly for perfect communion among all his children. And then that same Apostle John in his first letter tells us very clearly that it's impossible for us to say that we love God and then hate our brother. So we work hard in our prayer to find those feelings of hatred, division, and then eradicate them. Turn them loose. Um, my father's always fond of saying, let it go, set it free. And I think that's uh, how we should be towards these feelings of hatred. Of course, people will annoy us, and we get annoyed, but annoyances are not the same as hatreds. Hatreds are the desire for someone really to come to an end, for them not to be around. But I think it's much better if we can love someone through all the things that are difficult and all the things that make relationships difficult to come to a better place, a place of deeper understanding, it's not really a Christian saying, it comes from pre-Christian sources, but it certainly is something that's compatible with our Catholic faith. The one who understands more, pardons more. I've seen that at work in my life in dealing with Catholic schools and as a priest, that a lot of times we feel like, wow, that's terrible, they did something terrible. Uh, kind of hard to forgive, maybe. The more that we understand about people's lives and experiences, the easier it is to forgive. And of course, God above all things understands perfectly. So that's why he is full of compassion. A lot of times our mercy is limited because our understanding is limited. So this is another way that we come to know God as the one who understands all things. Understanding is more than just factual knowledge. It brings the human person into consideration. It's a level of, there's a level of depth with God's understanding of the human condition that helps all of us to move forward. He understands, but he also holds us accountable that we do the right thing. And he leads us gently and beautifully. Nothing better than to spend some time in prayer. Be it in the early morning as you get up, in the evening, uh, sort of as the day winds down before supper, when a little quiet time comes. Friends, I'm afraid we have to put down some of our action. We have to put down our cell phone. We have to put down any number of those things that distract us. I'm here to tell you, even if it's just five minutes in the day that we just sit in our chair in a quiet place, and think to God, we'd be amazed at what he can do. And of course, we know that our Lord asked the disciples to watch with him an hour. That's a beautiful thing, and if we can do it, all to the good. But we have to make some space to spend time with God in prayer. The things that I'm talking to you about today are, are they're high, they're beautiful, they're ideals. Well, of course they are, because we have to always reach for God. It's the character of our work. We live in this world, we deal with all the things of every day, but yet we try to reach for the heights. That's why I brought my little donkey here. I have to reach. Excuse me, Mary. I'll take the donkey. I've had this little donkey for years. He came from the Holy Land. But the donkey in the scriptures always brings good things. And um, 
The donkey is considered a humble animal and a beast of burden. But this little donkey, he can climb to the highest point of the mountain where a horse can't go. He might be slow sometimes, and he might be stubborn, but he can get to places with his perseverance that bigger or stronger or more thoroughbred animals can't always get to. They can't always obtain those heights. We're the little, we're little donkeys, just like the one that brought Mary to Bethlehem with St. Joseph, just like the donkey that brought them to Egypt when they had to flee the terror of Herod donkey that brought them back to build the home for the Holy Family at Nazareth, the donkey that brought Jesus into Jerusalem in triumph, that later they would crucify him, the same people that praised him when he entered. The little donkey was there, maybe not the same one, but some little donkey. Donkey needs some time to pray and think about all the things that he carries and the things that he has accomplished. So I think some time in prayer is never, never wasted. Sadly, today we can't actually take that. But again, as I mentioned earlier, I hope that you're able to make a little time today at some moment to carve out a little corner and just thank to God and let him do what he needs to do in our lives and in our souls. When we go to pray, sometimes we say, well, what am I supposed to do? Or what am I supposed to say? Some questions that we could ask. Where am I on my spiritual journey? Honestly, in your own assessment, where do you feel that you are? Do you feel at the beginning of a journey towards God? Do you feel at a point that's hard to get over on your journey? Do you feel stuck? Do you feel as if you've made good progress, but you're scared that you might not have the stamina to keep going in the same way? How would you honestly define your relationship with Christ. My relationship with you, Lord, it's been off and on. When I need you, I call, but sometimes I don't think about you. Lord, sometimes I treat you like the Coke machine. If I put my money in and get what I want, then I'm happy. But if I don't get the drink out of the machine that I want, I'm going to shake the machine. But you have to be careful because if you shake the Coke machine, it might turn over on you and squish you. Sometimes we have a Coke machine relationship with our God. We just want to put in what we think the price is and mash a button and get out what we want. We don't really ever think about the machine until we don't get what we want. Sometimes our relationship to God is one of, um, of anger, even. When bad things have occurred to us and we've suffered. But that's okay, because God can handle it. He's God. And he accompanies us along the way above all things. He's our best company, the best company we can have. So what is honestly my relationship to God, my relationship to the Lord Jesus, to the saints and the example of the Blessed Virgin? How does all that stack up for me? That's a good point of departure in prayer. Here's my little friend. A little friend is kind of in the middle of the crowd. Sometimes we feel like we're sort of in the masses. Does God really care about me? Does he, uh, so many things are happening in the world in so many places. How could he really be interested in me um, when so many things are happening? As I mentioned earlier, he thinks about each one of us constantly. And he wants us to love him, to love one another to know that we are special. So that's a, a wonderful place of departure in prayer. Who am I in relationship to my God? Because we're teachers, we have to ask the question in our prayer, does the way I teach flow forth from my relationship to Christ? If Christ has been merciful to me, Am I a merciful teacher? If God has been kind and sustaining to me, am I kind and sustaining for my students? Or do I hold them to a standard that I don't hold myself? We all know that there is always, and from the beginning of time until today, been great hypocrisy in the community of teachers. Do as I say, 
not as I do. Uh, that's in the scriptures even. Uh, the Lord gives very stern rebuke to the Pharisees that bind burdens on others but refuse to carry them themselves. We know that children can sniff that out in a heartbeat when we're not authentic representatives of what we're teaching. So authenticity and the conforming of ourselves to the ideals that we propose is always important, always important flowing forth from our relationship to Christ. It's not perfection, but it is faithfulness above all things. So how can we know Jesus more clearly through our daily work? Well, y'all, when we see the children, it's, we, we know him. We know him when we see these children come before us, be they little, be they big. Um, he comes to us in the disguise of these children sometimes. Just the other day I was talking with a religious sister who's very dear to me and uh, she works in one of our center of concern, centers of concern and uh, a mother fell on some hard times and she came to the center to get groceries from the nuns and uh, she came with her little son and they'd really been through some terrible times and just didn't have enough to eat and it was very hard for her. And the sisters gave them all the groceries they need. And as the mother was putting these groceries in the trunk of her car, this little boy, he had some play uh, Monopoly money in his pocket. He was four, four years old. He had this little play Monopoly money. Well, he dug down in his little pocket and he saw his mother put the groceries in the trunk. And he ran back up the steps to give this money to the sister because he wanted to pay for the groceries for his mother. So he gives sister this money and says, I'll pay for everything. We know the Lord when we see these children because that impulse to care for and protect the people that you love the most is born in God. And it is given to us and we're supposed to be good stewards of it. So we know these children. We know Jesus when we see them. Also too, um, when we encounter him, in uh, the ministers of the church and how they teach us, uh, the bishops, uh, the priests, the sisters, all those people who live public lives in the church, we know that we, as Catholic educators, we're doing something different than people in other schools because we are part of, at this stage, a more than 1,500 year tradition of Catholic education. Since the monks of St. Benedict first started to take children in monasteries and convents for schooling, we have been formally involved in this work, our whole church. Often it is said that we educate, not because all of our students are Catholics, we educate because we are. This is a part of our religious identity as a Catholic people. We run schools and we run schools all over the world and we do so because we've encountered Christ who is the master teacher and we want to be teachers like him. When our children discover things, the act of discovery is a way that we come to know Jesus more clearly in our work. When things are created that did not exist before, when those sparks happen and a young person makes the connection, all of a sudden, we have something new, something that existed in that person that did not exist before. So we're participating with God in his creative action through the Son with the grace of the Holy Spirit. So we see that level of discovery in the minds of young people. You know what it looks like when it clicks. And you know what a struggle it is when it doesn't. But we are co-creators as teachers. So we know him more clearly in that work as well. And then when our kids accomplish and win big things, you know, they feel good. But at the same time, we know that um, we don't win everything. But there are so many ways in which we comfort, give consolation, praise. At the same time, we expect high and important things from our young people. So uh, there's always a balance here. 
And that's how we bring young people forward uh, in grace to teach them that everything comes from God, that we are leading them to encounter something more wonderful. That we're teaching them not just to go out and make money or have a fabulous career or whatever it is. We are trying to teach them to live in the way that honors their creator the most. And that's how we come by happiness at the end of the day. Not through the things of this world, but by looking beyond this world to the things of heaven. So, you know, we all have our interior lives. We have those things that are going on in our soul. And it's from those things that flow forth what we do in our work, how we manifest our teaching charism. So let's see how we manifest the fruits of our interior life in our work. Woo! So, so many people have chosen uh, a life in the church as priest, sister, nun, monk, all these things. A lot of times it's because of the influence of their teachers. The things that their teachers have done and said to them, have been examples to them, have led them along the way. So you can lead a young person to a radical life of contemplation if you yourself are contemplative to some degree when you go to teach things to share a little bit of your um, contemplation. St. Dominic said to the other Dominican friars and sisters, you know, that they were called to contemplate and share with others the fruits of their contemplation. Well, friends, that's an essential part of teaching not just to stick to only what's in the book, but to share a little bit in an appropriate fashion of what your contemplation about the subject is, how it affects you in your life and your relationship with God. We see Mahatma Gandhi here. He was convinced that if all the people that lived in India could wean themselves off the material goods that they bought from Great Britain, that they could have independence. So he wanted the people of his nation to be free from the tyranny of commercialism. Does that sound familiar? Lord have mercy. We are not free from the tyranny of commercialism in our country. We are enslaved by the things that we have to buy. What do they call it? Retail therapy that many people are after. But we see him here spinning with a spinning wheel because he said, don't buy cloth from England. He said, all it does is cause hunger because it's not made here in our land. And so instead of just telling people this, he sat down and he spun the thread from cotton to weave his own homespun clothes, which he wore until the day he died. After he had this realization, he never wore a piece of cloth that he did not make with his own hands. Now, I don't know how many of you can go spin cotton into thread and weave it into cloth and then put it on, and you know, but at the same time, his interior reflection was made manifest concretely and authentically in his daily actions. He spent some time of the day every day to spin. It was a contemplative action for him, but it scared the entire British Empire and it affected the independence of India. So we see how our daily actions, when they're born from the fruits of our prayer in our interior life, have great power and efficacy. I always like the image of Mahalia Jackson because she was able to give voice to the spiritual life of many people through her song. In New Orleans, her tomb is there. It's made out of pink marble. It's one of the beautiful tomb uh, there where she is buried. And it's a beautiful place to go and, and meditate. But at the same time, when you listen to the music that she sang, and particularly in a time when people were struggling for civil rights and they were struggling to be recognized and having their own contributions as um, a racial minority recognized as essential to the life of our nation. Mahalia Jackson gave voice to the, to the suffering and the struggle of many people. And for this reason, uh, she was able through some of her daily actions, which was just to sing, to manifest the fruits of her interior life, her relationship with God, and her knowledge of God and her security that she 
took from him, knowing that he loved her even when other people dismissed her because of her race. Here's our little friend, Tim Tebow. I don't know, it's been a couple of years since this picture was taken and everything, but he uh, manifested his little faith. Uh, faith. He'd have his uh, Bible verses there on his, uh, under his eyes, all these things, and he has been an individual who has let his faith lead him in his relationship to um, his work, uh, relationship to other young people as a role model. Um, I've heard many priests preach homilies on Tim Tebow, and I always pray, Lord Jesus, let him live a holy life forever, because I don't want anything to go wrong with that. But he has uh, certainly been a person who manifested his interior life in the daily actions of his, of his, of his work and his interactions with others. So, how are you manifesting your faith life in your daily actions? Not just momentary or sporadic actions of prayer, but in the little things that you do every day. How you set up your classroom, how you greet your students, how you um, entertain them sometimes, maybe. Uh, the kind of lessons that you prepare, the extra things that you do. How are you manifesting the interior life of your soul in the daily actions of your life? Daily actions are quotidian. I'm going to give an example here of some things. So, um, quotidian actions are things that we do day in and day out. Most people don't even pay attention to them. You know, like sweep the floor, wash the dishes, um, take out the trash. You know, you hardly even remember that you did them when you finished the end of the day. But those actions... Young people are paying attention to a lot of the things that we do in a daily fashion. And so we need, to, we need to pay attention to them too. I always like this picture because it um, manifests for me a great energy. In this image here of the classroom, excuse me, there it is. We see the Holy Cross in the Catholic school classroom. We all have our crucifix there, which is the image of Christ's love for his people. The teacher is there. The teacher is clearly excited. He, in his face, you can just tell that he is engaged and he is engaging students. They have their hands up. They're ready to go. He's getting the answer. Um, and then what he has written above the board, your mind is your, most, is your most powerful resource. To remind people that the mind is a great source of power for us, to use it to its fullest extent not to ever be mediocre about the things uh, that we study or do, to always try and do our best. See, all of that that's in that picture is the result of hundreds of little daily actions, hundreds of little quotidian actions, things that led up to that. The person that hung the crucifix on the wall there in the right spot and it's straight and it's not just thrown on the side or just propped up on the chalkboard. It's in the right place. The classroom is clean. The chalkboard, he's got it full of the things that he needs to write to teach. The students are well-groomed. They are put together. They are involved. All those things. Think about the, the parents that washed and ironed those uniform shirts for those students to come to class so they would feel good and ready, or those students that may have washed and ironed their own clothes. All those things, all those hundreds of daily actions come together uh, to produce something wonderful. If only we pay attention to those actions. I had a student uh, one time um, at John Carroll who um, I said to the kids that if you pass a piece of trash on the floor in the school, you're as guilty as the one who threw it down there. If you don't pick it up and throw it away because the responsibility for maintaining good and proper environments is for everyone and, uh, and that student told me later that that was always um, uh, an inspiration to her to never uh, be uh, complacent about anything you know and uh, and later I felt really humbled because that student that never wanted to pass a piece of trash without picking it up is now a Dominican sister of Nashville, Sister Delia Grace, um, who was our valedictorian, I think, at John Carroll in 2010. So, um, so there she is. She, she couldn't pass a piece of trash 
and not pick it up and take care of it and throw it away to make the environment more beautiful. And now she teaches school and makes our world a more beautiful place by what she shares in her relationship with Christ, with the children that she teaches and the families that she encounters as a consecrated religious woman. We have to love God more. Falling in love is a beautiful thing. And in fact, it was said uh, one time by the superior general of the Jesuits, he was speaking to the priests of his order, and he said, just fall in love with God. And that's all that's needed. So we want to be the kind of people that fall in love with God, understand who he is, understand what our limitations are, all these things that we've talked about today. And that helps us to become men and women for others in Christ Jesus. I learned this first when I went to Jesuit University at Loyola in New Orleans. This is sort of a motto for many people who have had Jesuit education, that your education is supposed to make you a man or a woman for others in Christ Jesus to reach out into the world, to make this world a better and more brilliant and beautiful place to give glory to the Lord Jesus. All of us end up in positions of leadership in schools. Someone is leading someone else at every stage. What the leader loves, the followers will respect, if not come to love. So as a teacher, as a principal, as a vice principal, um, Whatever it is that we're doing, we end up in a position of leadership. And as we love things, the people who are around us that we're leading, they will come to love those things too if we're authentic. That's a, a beautiful and a powerful thing in teaching. That if you love the true, the good, and the beautiful, others will come to love the true, the good, and the beautiful as well. And that's uh, a great gift that we can give as teachers, not just to be lukewarm about things, but to manifest our love for the truly good things in the world. St. Ignatius Loyola founded the Jesuits. He, in his spiritual exercises, gives us some, um, some good things to keep in mind. The first thing to do is that love ought to manifest itself in deeds rather than words. So again, back to all these daily actions that I was talking about. The way that you sweep the floor is the way that you will love others. You have to have that throughout all of your actions. Um, some people have even said the way that you make up your bed in the morning is the way to begin to show your consideration for others. Second thing, love consists in a mutual sharing of goods. The lover gives and shares with the beloved what he possesses, or something of that which he has or he's able to give. In the same way, vice versa, the beloved person shares with the lover. So therefore, the things that we have, we share with the ones that we love. We don't hold back. We share things. So if one has knowledge, he shares it with the one that doesn't possess the knowledge. We don't try and make it like uh, too much of a hoop to jump through. We have a learning process, surely. But at the same time, we do want this knowledge to be shared. One always gives to the other in a relationship of true love. So here's an interesting statue that's in Rome. It looks kind of like a beggar, you know, someone that's asking, asking, asking. And sometimes we consider maybe people who are begging not to be very worthy of what we have to give. But if you look closely, it's kind of hard to see probably the way we're doing this, but if you look at this beggar, if you look at this picture long enough, you'll see that the beggar actually has a nail hole in his hand. So that the person who's hidden under this veil is Christ himself. He's holding out his hand begging. And when you finally take the time to look at his hand, you see that it has the nail hole that he suffered for all of us who are totally unworthy totally unworthy of what he had to give. The reason I always show this picture is because um, for teachers, students can make us bananas. 
And sometimes we feel like students just haven't done enough, they just aren't worthy, and we get this a little bit of a hard shell on it. Now, of course, students have to do what they're supposed to do. We all know that. But at the same time, we get on a high horse sometimes about being worthy. Again, when we know that our Lord climbed up on the cross and suffered and died for us who were totally unworthy and still are, he's making us worthy, but only because he loved us and continues to love us. So um, it kind of takes us down off our little high horse sometimes so that we can actually do the real work of teaching. And again, he's the master teacher. So We, in the Catholic Church, we have a tradition in the Latin language, and there's a little, little nice phrase here I've written, lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. And what it means is that the way that we pray is drawn from the, what, the things that we believe. The reason that Catholics pray the way that we pray is because of the beliefs that we hold as a Christian people. And then the vivendi part is how we should live. So the way that we pray is drawn from our belief, and then our lives are drawn from our beliefs as well. So we see His Holiness the Pope here celebrating the Eucharist, we believe that Christ is truly present in the mystery of the Eucharist, that he remains present in our midst. He promised us that he would remain with us. He's truly present with us through the sacraments, through his word, his holy people, and his ministers, his priests. And then all of that, we find our beliefs in the catechism of the Catholic Church. And a lot of times the students will ask us questions and sometimes we don't know how to answer those questions, particularly questions sometimes about belief. Keep a catechism and a Bible in your classroom. And when the children ask those questions that you don't know how to answer, we do that old teacher trick. Well, why don't you look it up and tell the whole class then? And then next thing you know, we've all learned something together. But having learned things and, have coming, have, and coming to believe things more deeply, we then have to allow them to change our lives and become those kind of helpful, supportive teachers that God wants us to be. You know, so we have our belief, our, our prayer, the way that we worship, the beliefs that help us to do that, and then the beliefs that lead us to act in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How do we manifest our, the law of our lives? How do we manifest our beliefs and our prayer in the way that we go about our daily work? A little moment of prayer too might be helpful with the Pharisee and the publican. You know, the Pharisee that said, oh, I'm so thankful that I'm so righteous that God made me so perfect. And I'm thankful that I'm not like this poor publican here who's all gross and nasty and disgusting. But the publican said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus tells us that the publican went home justified, not the Pharisee. So we can pray with that, that our beliefs, the Pharisee certainly had beliefs, and he certainly practiced his religion, but he didn't let his beliefs and his practice pour forth in the way that he lived his life. Whereas the publican, who had so many sins and was so imperfect, in the end, he did. So that's a little meditation for when you have a little moment to pray. The mas. Now, mas, of course, means more in Spanish. And uh, we get this concept again from St. Ignatius Loyola. Here's our friend. Um, the more. What more can you do for Jesus? What more is there that you can share? Can you, can you love more? You know, it's still the motto of a famous restaurant. We got the Taco Bell here. Live mas. So they want to convince us that by eating their nasty taco, somehow we're going to have a better life. But it is a successful advertising campaign that somehow you live more fully when you eat Taco Bell. I don't know about that. 
But what is true is that we do live more fully when we love as Christ wants us to love. So it's not live mas, it's love mas. What more can we do to give glory to our God? In Latin, that's called the magis, which I think is beautifully defined here as the restless desire for greater things, never being complacent, particularly in our work of teaching. A lot of people have known me over the years and I like things to be kind of orderly and, and put together. Um, I found this little uh, thing that says obsessed is a word the lazy use to describe the dedicated. But dedicated to the principles and teachings and love that Christ has given us, it's okay. Absolutely. Uh, because it means that you do have a restless desire for greater things not to be satisfied, not to be satisfied with just whatever, but to always strive for what is more in life. So, um, if we had more time to spread out, we could deepen our understanding of the graces that we're asking from our Lord Jesus. Um, one of the things sometimes that gets in the way of the graces that we ask are our fixations on some of our possessions, things that stop us, that hinder us a little bit, weight us down. The rich young ruler is a good example of that in uh, the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. The young person that came to Jesus and wanted to follow him, and the Lord asked him, have you done all these things? And he said, yes, Lord, I've done them. And the Lord said, well, one thing you haven't done, which is to go and sell all that you have and give the money to the poor and then come and follow me. And the scriptures tell us that the man went away sad because he wasn't ready to do that. So what are the things that we prize most highly in our lives? What do we hang on to? And what of that gets in the way of following Jesus? So there's a little chart here that has some data that was taken about what little kids, so the wee ones, say that are their most prized possessions, what the tweens say are their most prized possessions, and then what the teens say. So kids, we notice there's a lot of technology here. That's something too. And, and mind you, these kids and these tweens and these teens, they're us. They're us too. Number one most prized possession, video game system, console. The tweens say number one is pets, okay? Our puppy dog, our little meow meow, they're our prized possessions. And then teens say cell phone. Well, Lord have mercy, you know, people just can't put it down. And so um, pets are up there too. So our animals and our technology. Somewhere down in there, I think some people have said that Bibles are some of their most prized possessions, but I think it's past number six for everybody. Uh, maybe they're saying that to be uh, politically correct sometimes too, but um, we all have things that get in our way. I remember how terrified I was one morning, uh, I was in the seminary actually, when I woke up and uh, I reached for my phone first before I even made the sign of the cross or said a prayer. You know, that somehow I had trained myself to reach for that telephone first thing and that shocked me in a great way, and I hope never to ever return to that place where I, when I wake up, I don't remember God. I don't remember who made me. You need to make the sign of the cross when you wake up first thing in the morning and the last thing before you go to, to bed. A great spiritual director told me one time, he said, what you put in the mill in the morning, you will grind all day long. So we need to make those first moments of our day Day, moments that are dedicated not to our possessions or to our worries, but to God who made us and gave us life and helped us wake up again to enjoy this day. The cura personalis. This is how we take care of other people. This is something important for us as teachers, as ministers. The care that we take to deal with each person as an individual. As a teacher, we always make a mistake 
both actually and spiritually, when we have this idea that all the kids are somehow the same, there's something common among them all. Now we know that sometimes they do have things in common, but our attitudes need to be arranged around the fact that those young people are each individual. They are people who are human persons that are made in the image and likeness of God with their own gifts and their own struggles. So we have to teach in a way that respects that care for the individual, never a conglomerate, you know, never um, this group of people that we just homogenize and say, as we do in Alabama, all y'all, and then add an adjective. All y'all are whatever. No, they're not all. Maybe a lot of them, but there's always someone who is an exception, and that needs to be respected. Kids have so many needs. Sometimes it seems overwhelming, but God gives us energy in the way to respond to that. If we have patience, and again, if our interior life of the soul is geared towards listening in that fashion, then it's not going to be a burden to us. It'll be an opportunity. Because when that individual care is not given, it can really damage another person. People that just feel like they're being rushed along, they're just part of a, a cog in a wheel and things like that. Taking the time to be involved in someone's life individually, it doesn't mean that we have to uh, have an intimate personal relationship with absolutely everyone we meet, but we do have to have authentic relationships and interactions which indicate that we are interested in the well-being of the other person. So how do my daily interactions with others manifest my call to holiness and my conviction to the Catholic faith? I think a place to pray here is in the fourth chapter of John's Gospel with the Samaritan woman at the well because Jesus met this woman where she was. He had a beautiful conversation with her without ever scolding her or reprimanding her even though she was someone who had not lived a right life up to that moment. And as she realizes how much Jesus is interested in her well-being, she becomes someone who is equal to the apostles in spreading the good news. Someone who went around and said, I have met the Messiah. And this is before his passion, death, and resurrection. So this authentic interaction that Jesus had with her based on her individual circumstances led her to be one of the greatest missionaries and one of the earliest missionaries of the faith of Jesus. So we want to draw more closely to him. One of the things that keeps us away sometimes are our moods. You know, we, we're we kind of moody. We can be easily moody. And um, we sort of send off those prickles some days. We're all guilty of it. Um, but we want to kind of develop that relationship with our colleagues and our superiors and our students, for we have a constant sort of personality that is also born out of our interior life, of understanding what's good and what's bad, what's true, what's good, what's beautiful, as I mentioned. Our moods change, swinging here, there, and everything. When we realize that that is happening within us, we really are supposed to take stock. You know, we don't want anyone to uh, feel like they can't approach us because we're uh, sometimes great and sometimes not, and they don't really know why or when. So that requires sometimes a little depth to self, that how you feel that day, sure, we want everyone to feel well, but sometimes you have to just absolutely grit your teeth and continue to move forward uh, so that the people around you have access uh, and have that stability and that freedom to, to, to come to you and uh, relate with you in ways that are not dependent on our moods. That's an important part of, of who we are as Catholic school teachers. That's always shown, like I said before, in our actions. And I, I wanted to point out that I think it's interesting that in the sacred language of the Old Testament, the Hebrew language, Every part of speech in that language is drawn from the verb. And what that teaches us in theology is that the action words 
are the root of all things. What is it that God has done, and what is it that we are doing? So let's think about some verbs. And in English, of course, we have verbs with an infinitive, you know, to, so. What are the verbs that should describe our actions as Catholic educational leaders? To believe, to be a real believer, to proclaim, to pray, yeah, to turn to God and lift up our thoughts and our hearts to Him, lift up our hearts, to model Christ's behavior, to bless, preach the true word of God, to teach, to be the one that hands on the knowledge to the one who needs it, to praise, to confess. Sometimes we have to own up when we have done something wrong, and that becomes an example to others of humility, to witness, to point, to lead, all these verbs are things that change um, how people can perceive us if we live those things. If we are able to live a lot of those verbs, then we become truly teachers. And I'd like to point out a distinction. It is good to be a teacher rather than an educator. Teachers move people. Educators move processes. And I've always wanted to be a teacher. There's an interesting philosopher um, who was at Columbia University, New York in the 50s. His name is Jacques Barzun. He wrote a book called Teacher in America, and it had a little phrase in it that I thought was wonderful. He said, the quality character of the teacher, so a quality teacher in the educational situation in the United States is the only stable force in the phantasmagoria of education. A phantasmagoria is like the constantly changing sands of the landscape. So as you all know, every time you turn around, there's a new educational trend. People are saying, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, so on and so forth. New technologies, but friends, the quality teacher is the only stable force. The only thing that actually helps a child learn is a quality teacher. Not processes, but people. The teacher and the student and the relationship that is properly constituted between them. This is what brings education forward when everything else fails. Jesus is our teacher and we are his disciples. It is a sacred relationship as well. It's our leadership in the classroom that makes this happen. So everything we do in our work, all that we endure, all that we enjoy, can bring us nearer in our relationship with our Lord Jesus. So I've shared some things with you today. A lot of it kind of finds its root in how our interior lives, the life of our soul, gets made manifest in how we teach every day. This is information that began to be unpacked over a long time. But above all things, I think that when we do dedicate ourselves newly every year to the sacred nature of our work, that we can learn and appreciate more what he has done for us, how he is leading us, the great work that we're doing. Many things come from outside and sometimes make us feel a little bit hopeless in our work, but it is not a work that is hopeless. Catholic education continues to thrive in our diocese, in our nation, in our world, and it is because of you. Dedicated teachers, those people who get up every morning, and as I mentioned, go through so many daily actions that all come together to produce the effect that Christ wants uh, in our lives and in our relationships with others. So I thank you for listening to me today a little bit. I hope it... Uh, Hope it's helpful to you. I hope sometime soon to be able to be everybody all together in person uh, when we have our religion in service, maybe next year. So get to see everybody again. And uh, count on my prayers, though. I've been very much praying for all of you.
for this day of retreat and this day of religiousness because this in service is an important day in the school year it gives us a time to recharge and to come to love uh, god and one another in a special way by dedicating ourselves again to our mission as catholic school teachers and so above all things i want to share with you again my prayers and above all the blessing of god the lord be with you and almighty god bless you the father and the son and the holy spirit amen enjoy have a wonderful rest of the day and god bless we'll see you soon bye bye